Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is the Fujifilm XF 8-16mm f2.8, an unashamedly high-end ultra-wide zoom designed for Fujifilm's X-series mirrorless cameras. It costs around $2,000 or about £1,800. It delivers the widest coverage in the system to date, equivalent to 12-24mm, to 24 millimeter, making it ideal for landscape, architecture and astrophotography. Couple it with the XF 16-55mm and XF 50-140mm and it also means you can now zoom all the way from 8 to 140mm on an X-series body while maintaining a constant f2.8 focal ratio. In this video I'll show you what you can do with the lens and compare the quality directly against Fujifilm's other ultra-wide zoom, the XF 10-24mm f4. If you find my reviews useful, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button to make sure you don't miss out on my latest videos. Right, on with the review. The XF 8-16mm is a substantial lens, measuring 88mm in diameter, 122mm in length and weighing 805 grams. You can mount it on any X-series body, but it's best suited to the larger models, like the X-H1 here. The optical design employs 20 elements in 13 groups, has a constant f2.8 focal ratio, 9 aperture blades and a closest focusing distance of 25cm. As you zoom to the wide end, the front element slides forwards. There's no optical stabilisation, so if you want to iron out any wobbles, you should pair it with a body with built-in stabilisation, like the X-H1. The WR initials in the product name stand for weather resistance, with the lens sealed at 11 points from the rubber seal at the mount to the fluorine coating on the front element. There's also a substantial lens cap supplied that clips over the built-in petal lens hood. On the barrel there's a dedicated aperture ring offering settings from f2.8 to f22 with A for auto aperture control, followed by zoom and manual focusing rings, both of which turn very very smoothly. Thanks to linear motors, the focusing is also fast and quiet. If you're an ex-body owner who's into wide-angle photography, the 8-16mm of course isn't the only game in town. There's the existing XF 10-24mm f4 to consider, which is smaller, half the weight and half the price too. Here's how the coverage of both lenses compares. First, here's the 8-16mm at its widest 8mm. And now here's the 10-24mm at 10mm, where it's obviously not quite as wide, but still capable of capturing a huge field of view. Next, here's the 8-16mm at 16mm, its longest focal length. And now here's the 10-24mm to at 24mm. Clearly, while the 8-16mm can zoom a little wider, the 10-24mm's longer overall range and reach makes it more flexible for general purpose use. But there's more than just range to consider. In its favour, the 8-16mm is a stop brighter at f2.8 compared to f4, and it's weather sealed too. Meanwhile, the 10-24mm fights back with optical stabilisation, and while its removable lens hood does bring it closer in size to the 8-16mm when fitted, it still remains half the weight and price. There is however one more important physical difference between the lenses. Like most extreme wide-angle lenses with bulbous front elements, the XF 8-16mm lacks a screw-in filter thread of any size as there's simply no way to accommodate it. In contrast, the 10-24mm manages to incorporate a 72mm thread for screen filters. This is a big benefit of the 10-24mm, but if you do want to mount filters on the 8-16mm, there are third-party options available. Lee's SW150 system is a popular choice with a variety of adapters for giant ultra-wide lenses, including the XF 8-16mm, and some regions will even give you a voucher for the adapter when you buy the lens, which somewhat softens the blow as the SW150 holder and just one ND filter is going to set you back around $300 or pounds or even a little bit more. I tried the SW150 system on the XF 8-16mm and it worked to treat without any vignetting even at the widest setting, but again, like the lens, it's a large and unashamedly high-end option. If you're after the cheapest and most compact way to enjoy ultra-wide angle long exposure photography on the Fujifilm X system, get yourself the XF 10-24mm and the 72mm screw-in filter. So there's differences in their ranges, apertures and build quality to weigh up, but what about their actual optical quality? To find out how they compared, I shot a landscape scene with both lenses at four different focal lengths using all of their aperture settings. I started at 8mm, with the 8-16mm by itself obviously, followed by both lenses set to 10mm, then both lenses again at 16mm, before then testing the 10-24mm all by itself at 24mm. 
I'm going to show you crops from the corners and centers of the images indicated by the red frames and enlarged a great deal to really see the differences. I'll start with the XF 8-16mm by itself at 8mm and here you can see the areas I've cropped again by those red rectangles. Starting with the extreme corners, the 8-16mm to is impressively sharp even at 8mm f2.8, although stop it down to f4 and especially f5.6 and you'll see a small boost in sharpness and a reduction in vignetting, darkening in the corners. At f11 and smaller apertures, you'll also notice softening due to diffraction, so avoid those unless you're after those diffraction spike effects that I'll show you later on. Moving on to the centre of the frame at 8mm, the lens performs pretty much perfectly even with the aperture wide open at f2.8. This represents excellent performance at its widest focal length overall. In order to make a direct comparison against the XF 10-24mm f4, I adjusted the 8-16mm to match its widest focal length. So here are the results of both lenses set to 10mm, again with the cropped areas shown by the red rectangles. I'll show the XF 8-16mm crops on the left side, and the XF 10-24mm crops on the right. Starting again in the extreme corners, the XF 8-16mm by itself here at f2.8 exhibits the minor softness seen at 8mm, but there's still plenty of resolved details here. At f4 though, we can start direct comparisons against the 10-24mm, and it's immediately apparent how much better the 8-16mm is performing. It's noticeably sharper in the corners at f4, and even though the 10-24mm gradually improves as its aperture is closed down, the 8-16mm remains crisper while also suffering from less coloured fringing. Moving into the middle of the frame though, there's little if anything to tell them apart, so at 10mm the benefit of the 8-16 to over the 10-24 to is in the corners, plus of course the ability to shoot a stop brighter and still enjoy better results. It's revealing that the 8-16mm to at 10mm f2.8 is as good in the corners as the 10-24 to at almost any aperture. This is particularly important for those shooting in low light such as astrophotography. My next direct comparison is with both lenses set to 16mm, the longest focal length on the 8-16, to but a comfortable halfway point on the 10-24 to range. Again, the red rectangles show the cropped areas, and I'll show the 8-16 to crops on the left side, and the 10-24 to crops on the right. Starting in the extreme corners, the 8-16mm to at 16mm f2.8 again delivers an impressive result with only minor softness. At f4, the 10 to 24 mm joins in and again looks noticeably softer in the corners, although it does manage to catch up quite well when the aperture is closed down and essentially matches the more expensive model from f5.6 onwards. So, again, the major benefit of the 8 to 16 lens is being able to deliver better corner sharpness at the largest apertures, but if you're happy to shoot at smaller apertures, say f5.6 or f8, then the gap narrows between them, especially at the longer end of their focal ranges. Looking briefly at the centre area, both lenses again perform similarly across their aperture ranges, so again the main differences regard the corners. That's it for the 8-16mm, but for reference I thought I'd also include the XF 10-24 by itself at 24mm. Starting at f4, the 10-24mm at 24mm only suffers from minor softness in the extreme corners and quickly sharpens up when the aperture is closed to f5.6 and beyond. By f8 it's looking very crisp in the corners. Moving to the centre of the frame, the 10 to 24 at 24mm is delivering excellent results as you'd expect, but again for the best performance across the frame from this lens, try to close it to at least one stop to f5.6 or ideally to f8. If you really need to shoot at brighter apertures, you'll enjoy noticeably better sharpness from the 8 to 16mm, especially in the corners. Another optical test worth making is how well a lens can generate a diffraction starburst effect as its aperture is closed to the smallest openings. Here's a sequence with the 8-16mm from f2.8 to f22, showing the starburst effect with very fine spikes at 8mm, although they don't become really defined until you're close to f22, at which point the rest of the image will become a little softer due to diffraction. As always, it's, it's about finding the right balance between the definition of those spikes and how much diffraction softness in the rest of the image you're willing to accept. For comparison, here's a crop of the 8-16mm on the left and the 10-24mm on the right when both are set to 10mm f16 and you can see their different styles, the way that they're rendering those diffraction spikes. Try to ignore the blobs on the 10-24mm crop which are due to marks on the front element. You really do have to keep these lenses meticulously clean if you're going to close them and shoot directly into lights. 
Also know that these examples were using artificial lights employing multiple bulbs, so they aren't ideal for really defined diffraction bursts. Here's one more example of the setting sun with the 8-16mm at 8mm f16, and now at f22, showing better definition on those diffraction spikes, and I'll use this as a springboard to show you a bunch of photos I took with the 8-16mm to lens. Ultra-wide zooms are most commonly used for capturing expansive landscapes or large buildings inside and out, and for these subjects the 8-16mm to absolutely excels. The 12 to 24 mm equivalent range covers everything from wide to extreme wide, effortlessly swallowing enormous views or making a cramped interior look spacious. Of course, like all wide angle lenses or really wide lenses, you have to be careful to include some foreground interest, otherwise anything in the distance can look really very small and far away, but the potential for drama really is enormous. As you'd expect for a high-end lens, the 8-16mm performs admirably with minimal geometric distortion, virtually no coloured fringing, and crisp details right into the corners even at the maximum aperture. This is where it really excels compared to the 10-24mm, which only become sharp in the corners when stopped down. Of course, if you mostly shoot at f8 or f11, this could be a non-issue, but for low-light and particularly astrophotographers, the 8016mm gives you the confidence to shoot at f2.8 and know you'll still get great results. At f2.8, there's also actually some opportunities for shallow depth of field effects, especially at 16mm. Approach the closest focusing distance of 25cm and you can enjoy a little blurring in the background, allowing you to better isolate the foreground while still encompassing a massive view. Meanwhile, with the aperture close to f16 or f22, you can enjoy those sharp diffraction spikes on bright point sources of light. The XF8 16mm can also be used to capture dramatic video footage. I filmed these clips using the XH1's 4K movie mode, which may crop the field of view a little, but still delivers an absolutely vast image. The ultrawide coverage also makes it an interesting option for anyone interested in vlogging, as I'll show you in this next clip. Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is a quick vlogging test with the Fujifilm XF 8-16mm f2.8. Yes, a test with a lens, not specifically a camera. This lens is special because it's the widest lens available for the Fujifilm X system to date. Previously, it was the XF 10-24. This now goes 2mm wider, so it's pretty spectacular. And a stop brighter too. There are pros and cons to it when you compare it to the 10-24. I'll mention a few of those in this video. But the first thing to know is that there shouldn't really be any complaints of me being too large on the frame. So this is great if you want to do some environmental contextual vlogging because you'll be able to see plenty of your surroundings. And I actually only have the lens about oh, not much more than one foot away from my face at the moment. The XF8 to 16mm f2.8 brings truly high performance ultra wide angle photography to Fujifilm's X series. The older XF 10 to 24mm f4 may be impressive for its size, weight, and price, but really needed to be stopped down for sharp corners and lack both the brighter aperture and weather sealing demanded by some photographers. The XF8 to 16mm f2.8 addresses all of this with crisper details across the frame even at its maximum aperture, while additionally boasting a stop of extra light gathering power and superior build quality with weather sealing. It's also obviously a little wider too than the 10-24mm, although misses out on the flexibility of the longer end of that lens, not to mention its optical stabilisation and filter thread. Indeed, the presence of OIS and a filter thread on the XF 10-24mm coupled with its longer range, may make the older lens the preferred choice for some, and there's also no getting away from the fact it's half the weight and half the price. Indeed, if you're into long exposures, you'd need to also factor in the cost of a more expensive specialist filter system for the 8-16mm, in turn making the 10-24 look like a bit of a bargain. The older lens is also better suited to Fujifilm's smaller bodies in the range. But where previously wide-angle Fujifilm photographers had only one choice, they now have two. The XF 10-24mm remains a compelling option for those on a tighter budget or who value its size, weight, filter thread and optical stabilisation, while the XF 8-16mm will delight those who are willing to dig deeper for an extra stop of aperture, weather sealing, uncompromised optical performance and the widest coverage in the X-series range. If you found this review useful, please give me a like, and if you haven't already subscribed, please give me a follow and click the notification bell to make sure you don't miss out on any of my videos. And if you really, really like it, you can support my work by checking prices or treating me to a coffee using the links below. Cheers! 
If you're into photography without post-processing, also check out my in-camera book, which tells the story behind 100 of my favourite travel photos, all JPEGs out of camera with no Photoshop or Lightroom. You can also find me on Instagram and Twitter at Camera Labs. Thanks for watching and see you next time. Bye-bye.